Uh, children can be dismissed to nursery, children's church, junior church, all of those fun things. I assume they're fun. <laughs> all right. So here, here's one of the things... Um, one of the things that I've, I've appreciated the most about our time in the book of Ecclesiastes, if you haven't been with us, then uh, you, you know that we've been uh, working through the, the book of Ecclesiastes. We're in the fifth chapter uh, today. Solomon, the, the writer of this book, uh, Solomon is a, is a realist. I like realists. I like people who, you know, they, they see reality. They don't, it's not sugar-coated. They're not Pollyannas. They're, they're real. Uh, and he's, he's very much that. And He's not too deep, and he calls it like he see it. See, like he sees it, kind of warts and all, right? Uh, flaws and all. Um, and in this last half of chapter five today, that's where we're at. Uh, Solomon gets at some some real issues, kind of real meat and potatoes stuff, and he, and he hits these things on the head, and he speaks truth into areas of our lives where we can easily deceive ourselves. And I think that's an important thing, isn't it? That's one of the reasons, one of the things we saw out of uh, Timothy uh, in the last couple of weeks, that uh, the, the, the word uh, offers us maybe some uh, mirrors to look into sometimes that will uh, help us to see where we've maybe blown it. Um, and he does that this morning, I think. So hang on, hang on for a dose of reality and some really good advice from our boy Solomon today. So let's get started with, with what I would call the dose of reality from verses 8 and 9 out of chapter 5. Um, chapter 5 of Ecclesiastes, verses 8 and 9, which read like this. If you see oppression of the poor and denial of justice and righteousness in the province, do not be shocked at the sight. For one official watches over another official, and there are higher officials over them. After all, a king who cultivates the field is an advantage to the land. So one of the significant roles of government is to maintain a, a leving, level playing field for its citizens. All should be kind of treated equally under the laws in place. And in our own government, we, we are held to this truth that all men are created equal, right? Now, in, in Solomon's time, this was not always the case for all people, but government and the laws of that government are still intended to treat people with, I guess, predictability, if you will, right? You have a set of laws, you live by those, that set of laws, you know what the outcome ought to be. But what we see this morning is these two verses speaking to a different reality, isn't it? Solomon tells us not to be shocked when we see the oppression of the poor. And make no mistake, Solomon is certainly implying that the oppression of the poor is wrong, right? I mean, that's the whole point of this. But he's telling us it's going to happen, and we'll see why in just a bit. He also tells us not to be shocked when we observe or experience the denial of justice and righteousness in the province. It means in your town, uh, in your county, in your state, in your nation. Don't be shocked. And again, the implication is that justice and righteousness should prevail. But it will not always be so. And can we safely say that we have either observed or experienced both of these things? Right? The oppression of the poor and the denial of justice and righteousness? Of, of, of course we have. And, and often, I don't know about you, but it, but it, can, it can really stick in our craw and, and, and make us even a little angry, right? And, or indignant. See, see we, are, we are made in the image and likeness of God, and, and part of his character is his righteousness and his justness. This is in us, right? We, we see it. We recognize it when we see injustice and, we, and when we see unrighteousness. And then Solomon goes on and he tells us the source of our indignation, sort of. One official, one official watches over another official, and there are higher officials over them. See, what Solomon is describing is he's describing a, a corrupt government system where each level of government is served by the level beneath them with 
kickbacks, bribes, backdoor deals, and any other self-serving thing you can come up with. And verse 9 tells us that it starts at the top with the king. And and we've seen this in, in, in governments all over the world, literally since the dawn of time, right up to and including the present age. In America, we're, we're supposed to have a government that is of the people, by the people, and, and for the people, right? And, and, and there are checks and balances within the government to kind of short-circuit these efforts to be self-serving by those within the government. Our founding fathers did a pretty good job with all of that. Yet, even in America, we have seen many instances where the exploitation of the poor and the denial of justice have been on full display, haven't we, over the years? Why? Here's why. Because apart from a relationship with God Almighty, mankind is a selfish, self-serving creature that wants what it wants when it wants it and will work hard to make this happen no matter the cost. That's the reality. The founding fathers of of, of this country envisioned a government that would serve with altruism, right? Which means wanting what is best for the country versus what's best for me. And and some do, right? And some do, but, but others do not. Some have political axes to grind. Some have their own pockets to line. Some have ideologies that they plan to push that differ from our own uh, government system, our own constitution. And, And these ulterior motives tend to deny justice and righteousness to those who are on the right side of the law. And Solomon says, do not be shocked at the sight. When your tax bill goes higher and higher, do not be shocked at the sight. When innocent men and women are incarcerated, do not be shocked. When guilty men and women are set free, do not be shocked. When wealthy people are treated differently than poor people, do not be shocked. We are simply being shown a small picture in this passage of the depravity of man on display for all to see. Don't be shocked, but realize what the fix is. Realize what the fix is. See, they need Jesus. We need Jesus. Solomon then goes on and goes after another issue that is spoken of in the Bible quite quite frequently, including by uh, Jesus Christ himself. Look with me at verses 10 and 11. Solomon writes this, he he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity. When good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what is the advantage to their owners except to look on? Well, let me start by acknowledging a, a simple truth that money is part of our lives. Is that not true? Money is necessary to so many things, food, shelter, transportation, even even recreation. But, But notice the wording of Solomon. He says, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money. I'm not sure who the famous millionaire was that said it, but when asked how much money was enough, this man responded with this, just a little more, just a little bit more. He proved out what Solomon is telling us in verse 10. And Solomon's conclusion, this too is vanity, meaningless. I've watched this, man. I've I've even experienced this myself. And I can attest to the wisdom of Solomon of meaningless and vanity. When I, (laughs) you know how sometimes God puts these weird word pictures in your head? I had this weird word picture when, as I, as I read this scripture this week, uh, I, I, (laughs) God put this image of, uh, remember Scrooge McDuck? <laughs> so I get this image of Scrooge McDuck rolling around in all his gold coins, right? And, and in that moment, he appears happy. Yet, 
just like the, the real Scrooge in the Dickens novel, the day comes when he realizes that all his wealth cannot fulfill his need for true relationships, his need for companionship, his need for some things that his money simply cannot buy. All right? And, and I believe this, this love of money is frankly one of the tools of, that Satan uses well to, to take us off the playing field. Because money is something we need. So Satan uses it to entice us. He shows us all the people are, are around us who have more money than, than us that they're living in nicer homes than we live. They drive nicer cars and trucks than, than we are driving. They seem to eat better foods than we are eating. They wear nicer clothes than we are wearing. They have nicer toys than, than we have. And it creates in us a covetousness that quickly turns into or can quickly turn into a, a love of money, right? And hey, for a while, this may seem awesome. You may find yourself driving this nice, shiny new vehicle. You may find that you can now afford a better wardrobe. You may even find yourself buying that nice new home. But the end result will still be, according to Solomon and according to Jesus, vanity, meaningless, or worse. Verse 11 Verse 11 reminds me of, of those sports stars or, or music stars that you sometimes see uh, with their entourage, right? They have this entourage, these hangers on, these followers. And, and when good things increase, those who consume them increase, right? The hangers on show up and, and consume your stuff. Solomon says there's no advantage to watching all these people consume your stuff. Think about this. The very thing you love is being consumed by others. How do you think that's going to make you feel? Do you suppose Solomon, as the richest man on the planet, do you suppose he might have had a few hangers on that were consuming his wealth? I'm guessing he had a few hundred hangers on that were consuming his wealth. Here's how... Here's how Jesus put this money thing in his Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew 6, verses uh, 19 to 21, and then, and then verse 24 says this, Do not store up for yourself, yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth, rust, moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then verse 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. So what Jesus is, is doing for us is establishing what is, what is of true and lasting value. And Jesus makes it pretty clear, things that rust and rot not that valuable. Things that thieves can steal, not that valuable. Things that are important in God's economy, things that store up treasures in heaven, most valuable. Chief among these are our humble obedience, right? Walking in the purpose that God made us to walk in, serving Him instead of serving self, establishing relationships, loving our neighbors. Those are the things of high value. And then Jesus gives us this profound statement. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. My old pastor used to always say, I can tell somebody's, where somebody's heart is just by looking at their checkbook register. Now, we don't even write checks anymore, so that's a little more difficult, but I can look at your, your Amazon account statement. How's that? If your treasure is stuff, that is where your heart will dwell. See Scrooge McDuff. <laughs> if your treasure is your career, that is where your heart will dwell at the expense of maybe your spouse, your kids, your friendships, and, and yes, your church and your relationship with God. 
And Jesus then goes on to make yet another profound statement in verse 24. No person can serve two masters. Anybody here ever had two bosses at the same time? Isn't that the most horrible situation you've ever been in? Really, right? If you have, you know what it's like to be pulled in, in two different directions. You, you know what it is like to have two separate sets of expectations. And, and you know that you certainly preferred one of those bosses over the other. Just going to happen. And then Jesus gets down to this important truth. We cannot serve God and wealth. There's no equivocation here either. Did you notice that? There are no loopholes. Wealth as a master is a distraction from serving the one true God. And Jesus informs us quite clearly that we cannot serve the true master and the taskmaster of money or wealth. Not my words, his. So maybe you've been there, right? The opportunity for, for overtime comes and, and you just finished one of those months where there was too much month for the money. You ever been there? Too much month for the money? So you take the overtime and, and that next week things seem just a bit easier financially, right? And the opportunity comes to work on Sunday, double time. And that sounds pretty good after some recent financial struggles, right? And the check at the end of the week is bigger. Our appetites also get bigger, which creates a bigger need, which drives us to work more hours, which justifies the need for a new vehicle, which drives the need to work more hours. At what expense? At what expense? See, I don't know if you knew this, but there are only so many hours in the day. Do you know that? And hours at work are hours taken away from home and family and church. Hours at work are hours taken away from spending time in our relationship with God. Prayer time, reading time, study time. You cannot serve two masters, try as we might. One, one will be made a priority while the other one will be put more on the back burner. The Apostle Paul, while instructing his protege Timothy, uh, put it this way in 1 Timothy 3, verses 9 to 11, when he writes this, But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But flee, I love that, but flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. See, Paul shows us that this love of money thing, how he shows us how this money thing, love of money thing works. We, we fall into temptation and a snare. It creates in us foolish and harmful desires. It plunges us, he says, into ruin and destruction. Those are strong words. He paints a vivid word picture for us. And notice this, as I'm sure you have, money is not evil. It is the love of money that is evil, as we saw in Solomon's description. Paul then tells us why it's evil. Some, by longing for money, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Then verse 11, Paul tells us how to combat, how to combat this desire that can, can easily creep into our lives and creep into our hearts. He says, flee from these things, flee from the love of money, flee from the harmful desires that come with a love of money and instead pursue something else. You got to replace that desire with something else, right? He says, so, so do it with this, pursue righteousness, pursue godliness, pursue faith, love, and pursue perseverance and gentleness. See, what Paul is describing here is some of the fruit of the Spirit, isn't he? See Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Chase down those things and leave behind this love or this pursuit of money. 
of wealth. Well, let's get back to Solomon. He kind of continues on this theme in verse 12 of chapter 5, where he says this, The sleep of the working man is pleasant, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. So work in, work in, in the days of Solomon typically meant physical labor, right? My, my father-in-law once said that a man that does not work with his hands does not work. <laughs> Uh, obviously that's not really true, but in Solomon's day, it was much more true than it is today. And, and I know I have experienced this, right? A, a hard day of labor, like a, when we do a wood party or, or when I plant my garden or doing physical manual labor almost always guarantees me a good night's sleep. Can we relate to that? Yeah. Um, and, unless I'm so sore that I can't sleep. That happens sometimes too, right? We overdo the weekend warrior thing. Yeah. Combined with what we saw in the previous verses, Solomon is indicating that the rich man does not sleep well for he's worrying about his wealth and how it is being consumed by others. Now, I have to admit, when I first read this verse, I, I thought maybe Solomon was referring to the rich man who, who eats too much rich food and has indigestion all night. I've experienced that as well. Anybody else? <laughs> But no, see, the person pursuing wealth typically thinks about it both day and night. It is a consuming fire, Solomon says, that will literally rob you of sleep. The contented person, the satisfied person, their sleep will be sweet. And God can provide that level of contentedness, that kind of true satisfaction. Look with me now at verses 13 and 14. Solomon says this, There's a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun, riches being hoarded by their owner to his hurt. When those riches were lost through a bad investment and he had fathered a son, then there was nothing left to support him. See, it's one thing to be wealthy. It's another thing to be wealthy and to uh, hoard or, or guard that wealth. Solomon informs us that when we tend to tend to this guarding or hoarding of our wealth, it will be to our hurt, our detriment. He calls it a grievous evil. He does not leave much to the imagination here, does he, with that kind of language. Solomon calls it like he sees it. He doesn't sugarcoat it. And Solomon then gives us the example of a man who invests his wealth in an effort to build his wealth only to find that the investment was bad and he had gambled away his son's inheritance. Do you suppose if God has granted you wealth that it is his intention for you to hoard it, to protect it, to guard it as opposed to using it for his honor and his glory? Friends, one only has to look at the parable of the talents to see that it's not so, right? We gave this money to these people for them to use for his honor, his glory, his kingdom. See, money's not the problem. Money, money's an inanimate object. It is really all about us. It's really all about the, the condition of our hearts, our attitudes in relation to, to money that is at the center of all this money talk. Solomon has seen how the love of money can corrupt the heart of man. I, I can't help but wonder if this is a little bit of an autobiography of Solomon. So he's calling us to something different, something better. And he continues in this with verses 15 and 16. As he had come naked from his mother's womb, so he will return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Exactly as a man is born, thus he will die. So what is the advantage to him who toils for the wind? <laughs> Once again, we see the cheery disposition of Solomon in these two verses, right? Though Solomon is reminding us of our own mortality, the truth he speaks, it's an important truth, isn't it? 
how we come into this world naked and broke is how we'll go out of this world. Oh, there'll be there there may be some some money in a bank account, right? But what's a good what, what good is that to you? Can't take it with us. Try as many do. The old saying is still true. You can't take it with you. Exactly as a man is born, thus will he die. Solomon is calling it a grievous evil, though it, it is a plain truth. But what Solomon misses, I believe, is, is this. We have this amazing opportunity to, to serve God in furthering his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And, and we can do this through ministry from within the church. We can, we can do it in our work outside the church. And, and yes, we will take nothing from the fruit of our labor at the end of our lives. But during our lives, we can do many good things with the fruit of our labor. And many of you do this already through, through your tithes and your offerings week in and week out. Some of you do this by lending a helping hand to neighbors and friends in need. Some of you do this by supporting charities that, that take care of the, the least of these. You are making the most of the fruits of your labor and, and God's pleased with your obedience in answering the call. Solomon says it is no advantage to him who toils for the wind. Therefore, I would conclude that we should be toiling for something far greater than the wind. Right? Store up treasures in heaven, said Jesus. Be generous. Do not let the left hand know what the right hand is doing in regard to your giving. Realize that the job you have, the money you make, are both gifts from God and give back accordingly. Look with me now at verses 17 and 18. Throughout his life, he also eats in darkness with great vexation, sickness, and anger. And here's what I have seen to be good and fitting, to eat, to drink, and enjoy oneself in all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life which God has given him, for this is his reward. So verse 17 is, is the description given to the person who is, is laboring after the wind, working with no end game in sight, no vision for how these labors might serve the greater good established by God. Solomon says this person is like one who eats in darkness with great vexation, sickness, and anger. Man. He again gives us this very vivid description of a most unpleasant situation, doesn't he? Would anyone aspire to that? N nobody would aspire to that. And finally, after all this negativity regarding the love of money, Solomon comes to this conclusion starting in verse 18. Eat, drink, enjoy oneself and all one's in all of one's labor during the few years of life which God has given him, for this is his reward. I feel like Solomon is saying to us, you know, stop and smell the roses, right? F find ways to enjoy this short life that we have here on earth. Enjoy good food. Enjoy good company. Live life. It, it's not all about work. It's not all about labor. It's not all about the accumulation of wealth. It is about balance. It is about seeing the beauty of God's creation all around us, especially, especially in the people all around us, also part of his creation, right? In fact, he calls us the crown of his creation, the apple of his eye. Look, if we take that long look in the mirror and what we see is a, a workaholic that does not take time to enjoy the fruits of our labor. Solomon is telling us it's like eating in darkness with great vexation, sickness, and anger. Miserable. He's describing someone who's miserable. It's not how God intended for us to live life. So stop. Take a breath. Evaluate life. Make better decisions that would honor God that would glorify God. Let's finish up this morning with the rest of chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, 
He has empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. For he will not often consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. See, this is an awesome conclusion that Solomon gives us. It it does a couple of really important things. First, it assures us that God can and God does give some of us riches and wealth. Poverty is not a requirement of the believer. But notice, with this comes some responsibility, right? Solomon does not give us the specifics as to those responsibilities, but many other passages do in regard to the use of our God-given resources. It starts with the tithe. 10% of our first fruits, which means before taxes. It extends to our offerings, right? Opportunities to give of our resources above and beyond our tithes. We just did that with with this turkey drive. We see a need and God directs us to address the need as a, as a special offering. Many of us have experienced this when, when, we, when we built this church. We spent some time and we prayed about how God might use a building to further His kingdom. And then we asked people to sacrificially give to the project above and beyond their regular tithe. And you know what? People responded. People responded. And we're talking about conducting a similar campaign in 2022 to pay off our our mortgage here. More on that a little bit later. But we may have an opportunity to also give sacrificially so that this building is paid for and the money earmarked for a mortgage can now be used for other kingdom purposes. Kingdom purposes. Second, as God blesses, his expectation of us is that we would recognize the blessing, celebrate the blessing, and then use the blessing to to honor him. So receive his blessing, rejoice in the labor, for it is a gift of God. How How many of us consider our jobs, our careers, to be a gift of God? Anybody here? Let me ask you this. Who who gave you the inherent gifts and talents that allow you to do your job well? Where'd that come from? Who opened the doors for you to land the job where you are in? (laughs) We like to claim all that stuff ourselves, don't we? Oh, you know, but sometimes I think we miss how God is weaving himself into our lives. See, I believe that God is absolutely in those little things that then drive the bigger things in our lives. If we would simply open our eyes to see him and and to see how he's working. Now notice how Solomon finishes. Solomon has had this obsession literally since the first lines of this book with, with the end of his life and the legacy that he may leave. And here, at the end of this chapter, Solomon speaks to the man who is so in tune with what God is doing in his life that the, that the end of his life is not even part of his consciousness. God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. I, I love that. I want to be that person who is so in tune with what God is doing in me and through me that I, I don't think about money. I don't think about death. I don't worry about stuff. But instead, I have a a gladness of heart that is born out of my full relationship with God. As I serve God, He he blesses my heart with gladness. As I please God with humble obediences, He blesses my heart with gladness. As I confess my sins and, and repent of my sins, He blesses my heart with gladness. He does the same for you. It's a beautiful picture that Solomon paints for us among all the not-so-beautiful pictures that Solomon has been painting for us. And the difference can be found in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, His Son. The good news, the Gospel is simply this. A sinner such as me needs a Savior. On my own, I'm bankrupt, unable to pay the penalty of my sins before a holy, righteous, and just God. That is why Christ came and lived His perfect life so that, 
so that he could become the perfect gift, the perfect sacrifice for the sins of, of all mankind, yours and mine, paying the price for my sins and for yours. The scriptures say that all, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And Solomon tells us this morning that God can give us a gladness of heart even, even in this very troublesome world. Anyone else need to hear that today? <laughs> I needed to hear it today. And for this, I'm, I'm truly thankful, and I hope you are too. So here it is for me today. Work hard. Earn a living. Provide for our families. But balance all this by putting the rest of our lives in a perspective, right? Are, are we making time for, for prayer and for the reading of God's word? Are we making time for family? I mean, quality time, not just showing up, but quality time without distraction. Are, are we using our resources in a manner that would please our almighty God? Friends, I hope we can answer these questions well. And I hope and I pray as we consider them that God will guide us in this rebalancing of our lives. Let's pray. Oh, Father, to uh, experience a gladness of heart in the turmoil of what exists in our world today is so appealing, so appealing. And here we, we read about it in your word that it is certainly not only possible, but it's a desire of your heart as well. So Lord, help us to remove those things that are an obstacle to all of that. Help us to see the things that need to be removed, the things that are a distraction, whether it be a, a love of money, a love of career, a love of something other than you first. Help us to see those things. Take that long, hard look in the mirror and understand what it is that you're asking us to, to lay at the foot of the cross, to put it down, not pick it back up, put it down, leave it there, and then pick up the things that are pleasing to you, that humble obedience to your word, that serving others instead of self, using your resources wisely, appropriately, or maybe we be about your business and not our own. And Father, as we heard your gospel this morning, Father, I pray that there's one here that needed to hear that as well, that needs to understand the need for Jesus, that without him we are in trouble. Lord, open their hearts, open their eyes, they may see you for who you are. Draw them to yourself, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you join us as we close in song this morning?